Good afternoon. To be truly disruptive, I, of course, have my own computer, so that's going to take some time to set up. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Good. Yeah? I'm really excited to be here, particularly excited because we talk so much about value. I came in around Robin's talk and been hearing along the sidelines of the discussions here on stage, and I stopped counting the amount of times you've said value today after about 20 or so. The amounts you said profits and money, I can count them on one hand. So I'm really, really excited that we do talk about value, about value creation. And this whole big D word, the disruption word that I started a company around, Dare Disrupt, is in essence just about problem solving and creating more value than what was there before. It's not about destruction. It's about, yes, disrupting some things in the old to create more in the new. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And circular economy is at the center of it. My overarching goal is to make you all fall in love with technology. So a humble goal for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, but the reason is that I think that you have a huge role to play in technology development. It's not only about the engineers anymore. We all have a say and we all should have a say. All right, so this whole thing about disruption, problem solving, creating more value. I'm going to start out with, uh, with this picture that sort of is the epitome in my point of view of disruption. Sort of these very um, rude teenagers turning them back against Hillary Clinton. And it's not because Justin Bieber walked in through the other side of the room or something. No, they're standing with their backs against her because they're trying to take a selfie, right? And this is the really good showcase of what happens when someone comes in and redefines how value is created. And the problem is solved in a much better way than how it was before. See, digital technologies have an ability to make stuff free, and that really hurts. But we all need to sort of play with this idea, what if our products became free? Here, it's so free, it's so free and abundant that a picture of Hillary Clinton isn't worth anything unless I'm in it. So someone managed to move from a scarcity, scarcity model, which was about managing chemicals and paper and complex distribution network to something that is about abundance, right? And when something becomes free, then innovation blooms. It becomes so free that it's okay that after 10 seconds the picture disappears. Snapchat, I really didn't see that one coming. And it changes the way that we start consuming the product, right? We no longer have a physical album. After a couple of glasses of Pinot Noir tonight, try the face swap one. That's a really cool, neat a way to get to know new people. And look at this one. The big unicorn companies that we're all dreaming about being a part of. If you take a closer look, think about companies that wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for the photography being digital. How do you build trust on Airbnb if you don't know where you're getting on the other side? So we talk about Kodak and disruption, but it's far more. And we need to look for the ripple effects. Kodak was really just the beginning. Behind every commodity awaits a service. And that's exactly when we have the digital photography, we now can decommodify everything that was a product. We build trust thanks to the digital photography on this platform. And the commodity becomes a service instead. And this is at the core of the circular economy. And when we digitize something, let's say the photography combined with AI, what do we then get? We get IBM Watson that helps surgeons take real-time decisions at the operation table. IBM Watson that filters and categorizes CT scans not only within the hospital but across the hospitals to give better basis for decision-making to the surgeons. And now just this summer, this particular way of categorizing pictures, deep learning algorithms, is what makes IBM Watson produce a treatment plan in no less than 10 minutes. Why well, used to take surgeons 160 hours combined. Big news from August this year. Let's take it even further. Pictures combined with AI, 
voila, the Google self-driving car. This is a combination of neural networks-based algorithms together with classical programmable AI. And if it hadn't been for Steve Sasson and Kodak in 77 that invented the digital photography, we wouldn't be talking about self-driving cars. And this is really hard for us to fathom, but that's why it's important to democratize the tech lab. It's not only about the engineers anymore. The ripple effects are so much larger than that. And so the first thing is to know that when something is digital, it's turned into zeros and ones, we decommodify or we dematerialize, right? And everything starts talking the same language, zeros and ones. And that's why we can combine technologies across. And when we do that, we have actors that are the most disruptive ones and really annoying ones in the market that say, what if the service or product was free and we turn it into a service? The product disappears, we decommodify. And then lastly, this is really important in terms of the circular economy, that that changes things in society, it even changes us as humans. As Robin talked about earlier, when we turn the car into service, we no longer need to own the car. We just need to have access to it. The whole ownership model from the old era over to the access model is key to the circular economy and enabled by these new technologies. So we'd like to sort of approach this in three steps. First is to know when we're looking at disruptive technologies, digitization is at the core that Stephen talked about earlier. And digital is exponential. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then these creative crossings that we can combine technologies with each other, and that's where we see disruption. Let's start with the first step. I know somebody has seen this graph before, but it's, I think, the most boring graph I'll show you today, but it's the most important one, and I'll tell you, try to look at it before you go to bed tonight, look at it again in the morning, you cannot look at this graph long enough. This is Ray Kurzweil, CTO of Google, who looked at Moore's Law, our ability to double the amount of transistors per square inch of the integrated circuit, and in essence, our ability to double the computing power, and he extended that to the start of computing. And he saw that Moore's law, which is applied to the integrated circuit, is only the fifth method of computing. And so, from the beginning of the 20th century, we've had a doubling in computing power. And we've had two world wars, we've had a cold war, but nonetheless, we keep innovating. And this is really the core of it. When we cannot get more transistors into the integrated circuit, we're going to move on to the next paradigm of computing. We're already seeing carbon nanotubes or quantum computing. It really doesn't matter. We keep innovating. What does this mean, exponential growth? Let's try to look into it not as a mathematical sort of mysteria, but as a cognitive one. If I fill this stadium, it's a stadium in Copenhagen where I'm based, Pagen, and I fill it with water that drops exponentially, it doubles every minute. First drop, first minute, one drop at one milliliter. The second minute, two drops, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. I don't know if anybody tries to actually calculate now, but how long will it take for me to fill this stadium with water? Is it a matter of days or hours? Do I have someone who's exponential and bold enough and wants to crowd out the answer? Hours? I'm hearing hours over here. Minutes? Someone? 30 minutes. We have a really exponential thinker here in the front. It is 44 minutes, so I'll close. So you're sitting here at the very front, enjoying the view in the top. And the most important thing here is actually not how fast it takes, but when do you notice? 44 minutes, half full, 42, quarter, 41, an eighth. So probably too late. And that's how these technologies develop. Most of the time, it's just a ridiculous puddle of water in the middle here. So it's all about investing now, not to be surprised later. I believe Robin also talked about this, right? Don't uh, underestimate in the 10-year scale. We have not only an exponential growth in the technologies, in terms of the computing power, but also in terms of the data that we can have. So this is a picture from 1958 IBM. It's a hard drive. 
and it's a five megabyte hard drive. So I have one of those cool iPhone 7, 256 gigabyte, which means that I would need 50,800 of these ones to have just the same amount of information. So not only the computing power, but the amount of data that I comp compute with. And we're laughing at that one, but our kids are thinking that the floppy disk never existed. It must be 3D printed. So here in the cloud, where all the data now is, we're inherited with all these different artifacts from the analog era. Super depressing age test, I think, the envelope. Try to show that. Everything here is into zeros and ones, and that's why we've seen crossings. And the next era of computing might be blockchain. Decentralized computing power, sort of the Airbnb of computing power, enables us to come closer and closer to the end customer and cheaper, eventually, computing power. And this is all what does this really annoying thing, that we're not dealing with a system of division of labor. It's all about the digital divide. Who has access to these new technologies? And the cost of launching an internet startup now is a thousand times cheaper, according to VC capitalist Mark Suster. And that's because we've moved across these exponential developments of computing power and data management. And in between here, 2009 and 2011, the big shift is that entrepreneurs are becoming developers. And now in the next one, that, or sorry, yeah, developers are becoming entrepreneurs, and now in the next era, you don't even have to be a developer to be an entre entrepreneur in the tech space. And so some of the technologies that I work with on a daily basis are artificial intelligence, synthetic biology. Most of my research is in 3D printing. And I thought I'll just demonstrate how 3D printing is core to the circular economy. But it's really about putting whatever technology you're dealing with at the center and then see what happens when you combine it with other technologies. So I'll demonstrate with just 3D printing. This dream that we have zero waste production because we start building like nature does, one layer at a time. Big paradigm shift because we've only dealt with subtractive manufacturing technologies. And more so, the software is becoming so intuitive that this young child can 3D print his own prosthetic hands. And he grows, so he needs a new one a year later, and he can just design it, extend a centimeter or so, so that it fits his own need. He can design the color and choose, and it costs him about $100 to print instead of $1,000 to get it handmade. But this is really where it's interesting. I think also Robin talked about the network effects, how more and more people are gaining 3D printers. We start sharing designs with each other, and this is the Airbnb of 3D printing. 3dhubs.com. So if you don't own a 3D printer, you can go in and you can actually download a file for free, send it out to your network, and get a quotation within 48 hours. Certain price, certain color. In Stockholm, around Stockholm, I just saw there are around 300 hubs that you can print through. I've used it myself. It's a really cool tool. And about the dematerialization, you can get access both to metal 3D printers as well as plastic. And this is where it's really interesting from a heavy industry point of view, which is actually where I spend most of my time. And we're seeing these layering technology being applied in aviation, where this nozzle is 40% lighter, or this one 75% lighter on the BMW um, motorcycle, and so on. So we're really starting to see how this layering manufacturing technology is interesting for the planet. Um, but the dematerialization really continues. If we start dematerializing the product, we also dematerialize shipping, warehousing, inventory. Guys like Marisk, with I worked a lot on 3D printing, should probably look into this space. And so it's really here where it's taking off, the first drop, dematerialization. So let's look into decommodification. Adidas, they have now started their first speed factory. They printed for fun last year 1,000 shoes, this year 10,000 shoes, next year 100,000 shoes, the year after a million shoes. So they're going at a 10x rate. 
And the idea here is that when the speed factory opens, which is in uh, actually in five days, I recorded this yesterday, um, you can come in and get your foot scanned and uh, then get it 3D printed so that it works perfectly for you. This will be in the second version though. So in the first one, it's only about testing the technology out and probably your price uh, appetite, I think. But what if uh, we don't have these old players 3D printing, but we have one like Cody Wilson? And this is where it's interesting from the decommodification point of view. Cody Wilson, he came out with the Liberator about four years ago, which is a digital file of a gun. And it took about two days before the authorities woke up and say, wait a minute, who is this guy? Who is Cody? He thought that he was just exerting his right to speech. But in fact, is he an arms dealer? And when does the product become a product when it's digital? And now Australia has taken the first stand to actually say that if you just own a file of a gun in your hardware at home, you de jure own a gun. So we're seeing these really paradigm shifts across the board and within legislation as well, particularly. But more importantly, what he did was redefine the product. It's not really about printing a gun. It's about printing something, anything, that fulfills the same function. So the NRA fanatics were looking at him and laughing. This isn't good enough. It just melts the plastic after three blows. But for that one killing blow, it's probably good enough. And so I think that we're going to see this redefinition of product, and they're going to start acting like software. We're going to start thinking in terms of systems. Here is a door handle that instead of assembling about 20 parts, now we print everything in one go. And sure, it doesn't look like something that is good from a, from a quality perspective, but what if we just put it back into the 3D printer when it's broken, or where we have a new update in the software? These circular way of thinking is growing in light of all the plastic that we're wasting and using. EcoCycle is the first circular 3D printer, which in effect, you put in your old part into the 3D printer, you shred it, you put an extra pet bottle if that's what you need, and you get the new part out. And now we start thinking about products in a totally different way. Products start acting like software, fluid organisms, that not in this linear fashion come out through an assembly line, but where we get maybe an update from our favorite designer at home that says, download the latest part put your old one in the shredder and get the new one out. So this fluid relation to products. What about design? Designing the system. Because now, I don't know if anybody needs this sort of wheelbarrow for your USB sticks or for your memory cards. Is this really what we need? Or here for your Nespresso coffee things, that's absolutely necessary in terms of value, right? Or this one for your coins. Who uses coins these days? So we're seeing a lot of, I'm sorry, BS products. And it's really about opening up where we develop products to more and more people that understand the problem that we want to solve. Because we think that we're going to have about 9 billion 3D printers on the planet by 2030. If it grows at this current rate, we're all going to have one printer at home. That's probably not what's going to happen. We need to look for the creative crossing, the Instagram of 3D printing that changes the way that we relate to products. So I have this saying, don't design me a house because I see this house from China that is 3D printed 10 houses in 48 hours. That is interesting, but it looks just like it's always done. Squared, right? What if we had this guy, Vincent Cabillot? who is an architect who said that by 2049, he'll be using sea waste to 3D print sea scrapers. We'll be living 20,000 people in each sea scraper, and we'll be living and chilling with the orcas. And this is the whole thing. Don't design me a house, design me something I can live in. Or don't design me a chair, design me something I can sit on. And go back to the original purpose that we want to solve. Here we're chilling with the orcas. This is the only concept that I'll show you. But so we need help. We need help from the outside. And here is help that we've taken from AI to help us in, the, in this new age. So this is designed by a human, but this is designed by an AI. And it's 70% lighter, 
and half the size? Or what if we combine 3D printing with nanotechnology? The statue is 3D printed on a hair straw. Or what if we combine with material science, the first alien 3D printed part with a meteorite that fell last year in Argentina? Or down here we have with the biospace, the first 3D printed FAA approved uh, medicine. Or what if we combined with even more wacky stuff and say, what if we start designing products to not withstand time, but develop with time, truly like nature does? This is 4D printing. Welcome 4D printing, because 3D printing is so last year. <laughs> and uh, here is another concept of a water pipe that would contract the less water is running through the system or expand if there's more water running through the system. So it's all about questioning how we are designing our economy. And if you don't do it, I'm sure these guys will, about a live count of how many people get access to the internet with about two hours delay. And it's taken us 23 years to connect that many people to the internet. It'll take us four years to double that amount. 3.5 billion people with new ways of thinking to problems that we didn't even know existed. And so most of the time, if you're in the old era still, which I must say I'm, I'm sort of one feet in both, it feels like driving 140 kilometers an hour in the first gear, really unpleasant. So we need to gear up. And the first step, I think, is embracing this exponential thinking. We think linearly, but we need to start thinking exponentially. And when we're dealing with new technologies, that's going to be painful in the beginning. We're going to have this long stage here where we're looking at new technologies and products and laughing at them. But suddenly they double at the 41st minute or something. And that's when we need to know how to plan where our existing paradigm, the sunset strategy, if you will. And that real Kodak moment, looking out for those creative crossings, that's where the gold is. And if we do it right, we're going to balance the gain with the pain. So I'm not telling you to stop doing what you're already doing well today. I'm just asking you to plan for the new. And having that technological intuition to know that when you apply new technology, will you do it to do incremental innovation? Which is really important. But how can that release some resources for you to, at the same time, do disruptive innovation? And it all starts with trying to really take this question seriously. What if your product was free? And then, what new problem can you solve? As long as there are problems in the world, I think we still have some job to do, right? Thank you. Thank you. I think you both scared us and made us a little bit more excited. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions. You can raise your hands. Uh, otherwise, actually, we have a, a, a question. I think, I think I'll start with that. Uh, it's, um, it's a simple question. What does your company do? All, all these speakers here today have started with introducing what they're doing. What is your company doing? Oh, you actually <laughs> want to know. Here comes the infomercial. Uh, we do consulting and education. Uh, it's, education is really at the core, trying to uh, oh, have an open door to always keep educating ourselves. And it's really small nano-educations where you get to know more about blockchain, AI, robotics, and these things. And then we have a big consultants unit that we're growing at the moment, where we really try to help companies to, with this whole, what if your product was free? Because that's a really tough exercise, but it's an exciting one. And I suppose one thing you learn them is dare disrupt, right? Yeah, and, uh, it's fun. And, and the, the question is, um, can you be too dare? I mean, as we heard earlier today, you never know about the future. And uh, a lot of the customers, they have their business, they're doing quite okay, even though the world is changing fast. It's Tough to be <laughs> there, too. Yeah, absolutely, but it's fun in the process. I mean, I hope I didn't scare you too much. The idea is also that we get really excited and want to be part of it. Yeah. And especially at this side of the pond, 
in the Nordics, so I'm Swedish. Um, I really think we have a huge role to play, uh, in both in the Nordics as well as in, in Europe, to actually have our say and apply our critical thinking. As you notice, many of the companies that I showed are from the other side of the Atlantic. And so if we don't take part in the, this conversation and develop with our values, I think somebody else will. So this digitalization and disruptive thinking is changing industry after industry. Would you say that the old companies have any chance in the future? But I mean, it's so much easier to come new. You have maybe venture capital and you try something new. And the old one, they have their employers, they have their old business model. Have you any good example companies transforming themselves? What are the keys here to do that? Well, the lurking variable of disruption is that in the beginning it feels really hurtful, potentially, but in the grander scheme of things you'll actually see it as progress. I mean, think about IBM when they in the 90s said that we're not going to do hardware anymore, we're going to do software. That must have been really disruptive at the time, but now we're looking back at it and we're saying, you know what, that, was, that makes total sense. So we need to have a good, good idea of, of time. And, uh, and I think that Robin had a really good point about leadership. It's going to come from certain areas, and we're also going to have a lot of uh, pressure on our managers to keep doing things right in the company, to free up the resources for uh, doing other things. There are some gloomy um, researchers that think that we're going to have mass unemployment in the future because of what's happening now. Um, what do you see ourselves work with in 20, 30 years? Um, I, creativity is at the core of it all, uh, to really try to um, connect these dots between technologies that maybe don't make sense, uh, like I tried to demonstrate now. Um, if you want really like the million dollar areas in the uh, short term from three to five years, I think within AI, uh, a lot within artificial intelligence, but as well within biology. So the, cr the cross in bec between cognitive and biology is really interesting because a lot of the new technologies more and more start to look at nature for answers. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's where a really magical discussion that I'm looking forward to following. But do you think we, everyone, all these people that don't have that much education and so on, it's going to be tough? It's absolutely going to be tough, and that's why uh, re-educating ourselves is really at the core, both the uh, responsibility of big, com big companies to do it, as well as our states, especially in the Nordic welfare model where we can, to keep re-educating. But at the same time, be aware that the media, they thrive on fear. That's their whole business model. So they're not good at taking out the success stories where people actually reinvent themselves with new technologies. And I think we need to really be careful not to be too scared because it's not 40% of all the jobs actually. It's within the existing job categories. So we're not talking about the new categories we've yet to uncover. Okay. You're much more active now, so thank you for that because we have another question here. Uh, what would you say are the next industries that is going to be feel this revolution from the new technology? <laughs> um, Difficult. <laughs> in the heavy, heavy asset industries, I mean, we yeah. talked about this, if you're a heavy asset industry, um, how will you be agile in the future? That's the whole sort of dilemma that I'm working a lot with at the moment. Yeah. I'm looking at the commodity industry uh, and in the shipping and bunker industry, the energy industry. I think we're going to see a lot of things happening there. Uh, and it's going to come, I think, in a combination between the new players and the old ones, because uh, the old ones often call themselves conservative and that they're too late, but I think maybe that could be turned into an opportunity to uh, leapfrog. Excellent. Thank you very much for coming Thank in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.